Okay, are you seeing it? Yeah, d please don't don't change any of the settings because I'm going to go ahead and share it now, but it won't show up if you change the settings. So, those of you in the audience, can you see the? Um oh, I may be in the wrong room. I'm so sorry. Really unclear as to whether or not anybody can hear me. I'm terribly sorry, everyone, for this um, delay. So I think I'm still speaking into space and not really. Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> what a disaster. Somebody says that they can hear me. So I think I've managed to dial in. Yes. Okay. Heather, Thank you so yeah, much. This is Steve. Um, really. I have no uh, idea. You got, you got yourself working. I'm so glad. And I came in and actually. Thought I was in a different room and may have messed you up. So can I stop your recording and start it again? You can. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Recording started. There you go. Okay. Thanks a lot. So I guess everybody can hear me now. I've been sort of speaking into the void for the last five minutes. Really sorry about that. I've of course run the audio setup several times this afternoon, and I can hear myself great when I'm going through Voice over IP, but. For some reason unknown to me, that's not working. So hopefully this will will help us hang on here and we can get through this presentation um, with some rapidity. It sounds like we have a great list of people here on the participant list. We're also recording for people who would like to join in the future. So if you cannot hear me or the, the voice fails, please send a chat into the main room so that I can see um, you know, if anyone is having problems with the voice. So I'll introduce myself briefly again. My name is Heather Halstead. I'm the founder and the executive director of a global education organization called Reach the World. And I'll just go back here one slide to let you know that today our session title is Building Context, Competence, and Confidence um, via Virtual Exchange. So Reach the World itself is a provider of virtual exchange. We have been working to provide virtual exchange opportunities to youth for about 18 years. So we have a fair amount of expertise in this particular department. And I'm excited to talk with you all today about the importance of virtual exchange as an educational tool and some of the other assessment strategies that we can use as educators to help our students engage in virtual exchange and get the most out of it. So today I'll be speaking specifically about the experiences of Reach the World and also generally about virtual exchange. Um, here's a little bit of a further agenda. Our first activity was the mapping activity, which due to the long delay of getting my audio going, no doubt you have all already had fun with. We'll then go into some examples of students' maps. We'll talk about mental mapping as an assessment tool for educators. We'll get into what is virtual exchange and how does it relate to mental mapping. Look at some examples and then hopefully have a little bit of time here at the end for um, questions and answers. So when you guys were waiting for me, I gave you via the chat window the activity, draw your mental map. And this is a prompt that Reach the World gives to all of our students in every program that we run on day one of the program. So we always start from this point. What are the students' mental maps? What do the students hold in their minds as they envision the world and as they look at their, their own place in that world? So I'm sure that all of you can draw mental maps of the world with a reasonable degree of confidence. And no doubt every person on this call can discuss and talk and describe many things about the world and its geography, its human environment, and its physical environment due to your own exposure to global themes. However, this is not always the case for every child and certainly is not the case for a very young child at the beginning of his or her life and his or her exposure to geographic themes and topics. So mental mapping um, is a wonderful and very interesting and also quite entertaining 
assessment methodology that you can use with your students, whether you are an educator in a classroom, and I know we have one um, sixth grade educator here with us today, and we have several others as well. Um, it's also a tactic that schools can employ um, system-wide to be able to assess where students are with regards to their ideas about the world and how to help them progress toward greater proficiency in that particular regard. So our essential question today was when we're talking about mental mapping is how do children develop and internalize their ideas about the world and about their place in it, which is a very important component of mental mapping. Um, so if you think about it, if, if you yourself um, interface daily with young children or if you have your own young children in your life, Think about it, you know, before a child has received any formal instruction in geographic literacy, how does he or she think of the world and how would he or she represent that idea on paper? Um, as a child is progressing toward geographic literacy, are there stages of that development? What do those stages look like? And how can educators define those cognitive hurdles that children need to surmount as they are moving toward proficiency in geographic literacy? Um, what does literacy really look like in geography, and do we need to redefine the ways in which we teach um, geography and global issues in today's very globalized world? I'm going to give you a few examples from a study that Reach the World ran from 2003 to 2008 in partnership with National Geographic and some researchers at Teachers College to try to discover some answers to these questions. So here's our first sample map. And if you look closely at this sample map, which this particular map was drawn by a second grade student, um, you can see that we always see in the mental maps that students provide to us at the beginning of our program, we always see that the maps provide context. So the students are contextualizing themselves in their world and they're representing on paper what it is that they know about the world that they inhabit. So this kind of map that we're looking at here first um, it is, is an example of a context provided by a child who is a recent immigrant to the United States from the country of Colombia and is now living, of course, in America or the United States, as we frequently instruct, is the correct term. So this kind of context is a common one that you find at the beginning of the arc of proficiency. The second map is another interesting kind of context that we show students representing in their mental maps. Um, just take a look at all of the objects represented here in this very colorful and enigmatic map. And you can probably determine from reading the titles of what is represented here that this student is most likely a resident of New York City, and that this student certainly has some personal exposure to the country of Mexico. And we also see Houston on there. We see several other inclusions um, that, of course, stem and stream from that student's exposure to geographic themes in education. But you see that the dominant influences here are the student's personal exposure, their personal context to both the community in which they live. And in this case, um, we know that this was a fourth grade student who, whose family had strong ties to Mexico. Um, the third kind of influence that we see in, in mental maps at the beginning of the arc of, of global confidence would be environmental influences. And by environmental, I don't necessarily mean um, the physical environment. I mean, what do we find in the environment around us? So um, this example is one of my favorite ones to show. It's a little bit hard to read for some reason, getting a bit distorted here. But if you look right in the smack dab in the middle, you'll see a large country called Chuck E. Cheese which um, is the kind of inclusion that we frequently find with mental mapping. And if you do this activity with your students, you will also see them including places that are of cultural significance to them because they are fun, because they are places they've heard about. You know, for example, we frequently see Disney World and other such things um, featured prominently and large on our students' mental maps of the world. And that is an important environmental influence that shapes um, how students view their world and how they define their aspirations about exploring that world. The second kind of environmental influence that we see constantly in our diagnostic mapping would be inclusion of environmental influences such as what we hear on the news. And this kind of map here where we prominently see featured the Afghanistan terrorist as a country is another strong example of the ways in which young students absorb from the news, from the paper, from conversation that they may hear around them, from what is happening at large in their community. Um, important geopolitical references that become embodied as, as countries within their maps, but oftentimes about which they have very little ability to discuss, describe, and contextualize. So environmental influences are very important to mental mapping. And then this map I always put in to show that young students, this was a fifth grade student, have a very absorbent minds for mapping and for geographic exploration. If you look closely at this particular map, you will see that this student, had, when given the prompt draw map of the world, put in all the places you know, has drawn a very detailed 
map of the New York City subway system and all of the lines are, are sort of relatively correctly represented. So you really see their immense capacity for and curiosity about the world around them and how to describe and define and include themselves in that context. And the question that we ask ourselves when we talk about mental mapping is how can we challenge students more? How can we engage them more? How can we take advantage of their tremendous curiosity and that, that absorptive mind to be able to give them a more representative picture of the globe, of their place in the global context, and of the aspirations that could define their future pathways therein. Um, assessing mental mapping is um, a wonderful activity for you to do as educators, if we have any principals here, if we have any assistant principals, um, the, the ability to have students draw these maps of the world, and then use an assessment rubric, such as the sample one provided here, to assess the stages that students are moving through and to meet them where they are when it comes to later defining your own instruction, your geographic and your, your social studies um, and your global lens instruction. This kind of assessment rubric, which this is one proprietary to reach the world, but which we provide on our website for anyone to utilize, um, helps you, the educator, to take in your students' freehand maps. That's what we call these. We call them freehand maps, the internally held maps that students draw, and to sort them along the set of cognitive stages that you see going along the top here. So the researchers with whom we work we did define six cognitive stages that all students move through as they reach proficiency and as they reach the ability to represent and more importantly discuss the kind of map that you all no doubt could create or did create while you were waiting for the session to start. So assessing mental mapping, doing a pre and post program or a pre and post intervention assessment is a wonderful tool for you as educators to use and to be curious about and to help group your students into ability groups. Um, what are the things that move a mental map? So how do we move from, um, from a child who has had no exposure to geographic um, instruction toward proficiency? Um, the primary cognitive hurdles that the researchers have discovered um, learners face include the fat map, flat map versus round globe transition. A lot of especially younger learners have great difficulty um, conceptualizing the difference between a flat map and a round globe and how those two things relate. So that's a big hurdle to be overcome. The concept of nesting, which is putting cities inside um, countries, inside continents, is a big cognitive hurdle, a specific one that students need to overcome as they wrestle with these concepts and, and learn to internalize them and then represent them externally. And scale, the relative size of geographic objects that I want to drive home here, most important is divorcing the relative scale of geographic objects from their personal perception or their ego. So students, we all see the world and see our own place in the world through the lens of our ego, especially when we're very young. Um, as we learn, as we grow, as we become more mature in our thinking, we're able to separate these two factors and more accurately represent the, diff the scale of the different objects of the globe and then come to a better understanding of how these, all of these things relate together to inform what goes on in the world around us. Um, so the other primary movers of students as they face these cognitive hurdles would be their local and personal influences, as we already saw in the maps um, demonstrating context. Their environmental influences, what is happening in the world, what is happening in the news, what is happening in their culture, and then also global influences. And this is where we get into the concept of virtual exchange as a way in which to bring this sort of global personal relationship driven mover into the lives of students who are developing these important mental maps. So I'm sort of rushing along here because of course we're running out of our half hour, but I'll try to do it quickly and hopefully still have a little time at the end for some questions. So virtual exchange is a two-way relationship enabled by a virtual platform. So the internet, Skype, voice over IP technology. Um, in a sense, we are having currently not really an exchange, more of a one-way street right now, but we are having a virtual exchange presently on this platform. Um, virtual exchanges can be classroom to classroom, or they can be adult to classroom. Um, virtual exchange is becoming tremendously popular, especially in the shifting education environment presently, where the whole market and the whole sector is shifting more towards prioritizing the value of an enriched education. Virtual exchange is becoming very popular these days. Um, typically, virtual exchange programs include a shared project plan or a shared curriculum map between the exchanging parties, um, communication via messaging, voice over IP or both, collaborative online space, and embedded assessment. So those, that's sort of a general definition of what is virtual exchange. Um, going on to the next slide, I wanted to present to all of you, reach the world's um, own perspective. You may have a different perspective in this, but if you were to ask us at Reach the World, who really are experts in providing virtual exchange to classrooms, what is the best way for a virtual exchange to serve the educational environment? We would give you this progression. 
Um, first, educators provide their own curriculum map. When they first enter the virtual exchange, whether it's classroom to classroom or adult to classroom, the educator should lead with whatever his or her curriculum map is. The second um, additive would be that the virtual collaborators, the classroom abroad, the adult abroad who is, is coming in via that virtual platform is mapped into the curriculum map. So whether it's a classroom or and a classroom together creating a collaborative map on a virtual platform or whether it's an adult abroad voice coming into the curriculum, all of that should be mapped into the educator's goals, into the standing curriculum so that in the end you come out at the end of the equation with an integrative online journey that's a value add to the educator and not an extra. So that's a really important perspective for us to share about our own work with virtual exchange. I'll skip over this slide. It's very texty, and you're welcome to come back and listen to the recording and read it again. But um, Reach the World is one of the primary providers of virtual exchange in the country. We have been doing this work since 1998. And we strongly believe that success in today's workforce will depend on students' ability to activate their own global journey through work and through life. So we see virtual exchange as an important tool to help students build the skill set necessary to be able to succeed both in the workforce and in life in today's global community. Um, this is a little bit of our virtual exchange model. Um, Reach the World works primarily with volunteer travelers who share their journeys online with kindergarten through 12th grade youth on our website. So our website is our platform. We also use voice over IP technology to enable the relationships. Um, and in the middle of this equation here would be our content editors who are the intermediary between the traveler who is a volunteer and the classrooms to make sure that you, the educators, are getting finely tuned, well edited, and suitable content for your students. Um, a little bit more about the who's who of our particular take on virtual exchange. Um, the Reach the World travelers are primarily post-secondary travelers. These would be college students on study abroad programs, graduate students on research abroad programs, gap year students on intern abroad programs, et cetera. So these are digital natives. They are passionate about sharing their personal journeys down the education pipeline. They're also preparing for their own next step in their own career journeys, making them great mentors. Um, the educators, of course, would be you school or after school kindergarten through 12th grade teachers comfortable with technology and eager to enrich your own curriculum with a global voice. And then again, again, skipping quickly through the editorial voice in our particular model, we do do a lot of quality control for our content to make sure that all of it is feasible for use in the classroom setting. Um, Reach the World as a virtual exchange provider can theme content coming in from the virtual platform via a variety of different themes. We have our general global lens theme. We have STEM through a global lens where we are tapping abroad travelers who are majoring in the STEM disciplines in college and who are interning abroad in the STEM capacity, so bringing their exciting real life stories into your STEM curriculum. Um, we're also tapping um, college students at a time in their life when they are preparing for career and therefore bringing their voices into the classroom as representatives of careers through a global lens and how to map a pathway toward those careers is an important theme for us too. Um, I'll skip the content types produced by travelers because we're just a couple minutes away from our deadline here, but be informed that on our platform, at least, our travelers who are our virtual exchange providers are producing content of these four different types um, following your curriculum map at the, as the educator in order to enrich the standing curriculum that you are delivering. So some distinguishing features about Reach the World's virtual exchange platform is that it is an adult two classroom model. Um, you educators have the discreet and important responsibility to direct the travelers to be your eyes and ears abroad. So your standing curriculum is the driving force behind the virtual exchange, and you receive content from this program that's specifically targeted to your curriculum and to your students' reading level. And most importantly, your students through virtual exchange, either on our platform or on any platform, will form personal globally oriented relationships with their travelers. And those relationships will be a primary driver of the development of your students' own internal mental map of the world. Um, so other tools for virtual exchange in the market. Um, in general, virtual exchange is a very powerful and adaptive learning tool for you, you as an educator in your classroom. There are many organizations out there that do offer a flexible online community for classroom to classroom virtual exchange. One of my favorite such organizations is iEARN USA. Um, of course, iEARN has also been presenting during this, this fabulous, fabulous Global Education Conference Day, so you can certainly learn about their programming, their classroom-to-classroom -classroom programming in the recorded webinars. Um, some programs offer a highly structured curriculum that if your school or your learning environment 
has a very open um, curricular environment where you can adopt a structured curriculum into your school day, the Jason Project is a fantastic program that can help you with that, and also Global Cities. Those are two of my favorite other organizations um, that do offer that more highly structured um, curriculum for you to adopt. But really, in conclusion, all virtual exchange programs do increase students' context about their world, their confidence as global citizens, and their confidence as they prepare to move through the K-12 arc um, toward college and toward career. And just as we close, um, and hopefully have just one or two minutes for questions, um, these are some testimonials from our own virtual exchangers. Um, my very favorite comment ever given to me by a fourth grade student reached the world. You know, you taught me that people all around the world face the same struggles that I do. And I think that's an incredibly important sense of perspective for young children to be able to share through the power of virtual exchange. Um, we also see a lot of comments from students about self-efficacy. Um, this comment from the young boy in the center is very moving in terms of um, how it is that when we do have a narrow mental map of the world, for example, our very first map that we examined where only two countries were represented, the United States and the country in Colombia from whence the student had emigrated, you know, this does not necessarily lead a student to have a broad set of aspirations about what he or she may do in the world one day. So as we broaden that, as we broaden our mental map, um, these students and all of us can move into a greater set of aspirations. And then, of course, on the right, um, we have one of our wonderful principals teaching us and talking to us about the power of virtual exchange to broaden horizons within the school. Um, I will close with this final image. Um, I'll give you one of our maps that we looked at at the very beginning here on the left, and I'll give you the same student's post-program map on the right. And while you may look at this and not really see this as a um, sign of definitive progress in mental mapping, I want to um, sort of affirm and let you know that Reach the World and many other thinkers in the realm of mental mapping don't define proficiency categorically when it comes to cognitive development and global literacy. We are not primarily interested in the absolute correct placement of every element on the globe as represented by a formal map because, of course, if you go and look at the map from different perspectives around the globe, you'll see lots of different perspectives depending on where you're standing on the planet. So the interesting thing to us about this kind of pre- and post-program movement is that Brazil, which was the country um, that this student was following, her, her college traveler was studying abroad in Brazil, and she spent a semester learning via that human relationship about um, Brazil in a global context, suddenly became the center of her world. Um, she, this student also developed important markers, such as the North and South Pole, and also developed what's called um, a sense of scale with the ocean being present as an intermediary between land masses. So there's a lot of progress here, but the interesting part is how the global community becomes front and center and becomes increasingly better populated and better peopled with the human and physical environments of the globe as students are able to develop human relationships with global mentors. So that was a quite a rushed presentation. Really sorry again about the audio at the beginning. Um, I'll put up this slide here if you'd like to learn more about Reach the World virtual exchange programs or virtual exchange in general. Here would be who to contact. And if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to type them into the chat window and I can speak to them quickly before I close up. So I'll just pause there to see if anybody has anything, anything they'd like to share. All right, looks like we have a busy day with everybody heading off to more webinars about global education. So thank you to those who are able to join. Really appreciate your attention and your curiosity about mental mapping. Make sure to put that into play in your own classrooms um, in the next little while here. And we look forward to seeing you on the virtual exchange platforms um, around the globe. Take care.